First of all, I want to highlight that I'm delivered the, delivering this speech from the ancestral and unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. This is the third reading of Bill S-244, entitled An Act to Amend the Department of Employment and Social Development Act and the in Employment Insurance Act. It aims to create an, an Employment Insurance Council to strengthen social dialogue within the EI Commission. Dans mon discours précédent, j'ai longuement parlé des fondements... In my previous speech, I spoke at length about the foundations of social dialogue and its merits. I also referred to the International Labor Organization's conventions on the practice of social dialogue in unemployment insurance programs to which Canada is a signatory. Without wanting to repeat myself, I'd like to reiterate the following facts. Unemployment insurance came to Canada in 1911, which was late compared to England and other European countries. Under the 1867 Constitution, unemployment insurance was considered a provincial responsibility. It was therefore necessary to amend the Constitution in 1940 to give the federal government exclusive responsibility for this area of jurisdiction. Insurance was originally managed by a tripartite agency representing business, labor, and government. This agency was independent of ministerial powers until the mid the mid-1970s, when the Unemployment Insurance Commission became part of the Department of Employment and Social Development, the then department. It was not the same name, but it was uh, the same department. <clears throat> Until 1988, the Commission relied on the advice of joint advisory councils made up of an equal number of business and labor representatives. The main four being the National Employment Committees until 1965, then the UI Advisory Committee until 1976, then the Employment and Immigration Advisory Committee until 1992, and the Canadian Labour Force Development Board, 1998. Désormais, l'assurance chômage, qu'on appelle maintenant... Unemployment insurance, now called employment insurance, since 1994, is now managed by the department. Although the influence of social partners is recognized in principle, since the Employment Insurance Commission includes a commissioner representing business and a commissioner representing labor, it differs from the best practices of social dialogue recommended by the OECD and by international conventions of the International Labour Organization. The bill aims to create in the EI Act an advisory council to the EI Commission co-chaired by the two commissioners representing the labour market, meaning the employers commissioner and the workers commissioner. It is supported by representatives of Canada's major employer and worker groups. Why this bill? In a nutshell, to improve the Commission's effectiveness in its role as advisor to the government by informing it of the needs and approaches favored by labor markets players, proposing mutually beneficial public strategies, and facilitating the implementation of public strategies and policies in the employment insurance sector. La Commission actuelle de l'assurance emploi, comme je le disais, est as I was saying, the current Employment Insurance Commission is made up of four people, the Deputy Minister and Assistant Deputy Minister of the Department of Employment and Social Development, and two commissioners, one appointed after consultation with labor organizations and the other after consultation with business associations. It's chaired by the Deputy Minister, in his absence by the Assistant Deputy Minister. The Commission has an advisory role. It's usually the Commission Chair i.e. the Deputy Minister who speaks on behalf of the Commission. The Deputy Minister is appointed by the Governor and Council and reports to the Minister. Commissioners consult with communities they represent, but cannot arbitrate between differing opinions to arrive at a common view. The purpose of this bill is to create a permanent roundtable that will bring clarity 
and uh, to, the, to the various consultations undertaken to the government by making the necessary arbitration to produce clear and common advice. Bill S-244 aims to create an advisory council to the employment insurance as to, so as to facilitate the commission task of providing consensus advice based on experience in the field and the experiences of businesses and the workforce. Les associations syndicales et du milieu des affaires dont les memberships se déclinent à l'échelle. National, provincial, sectoral and business and union associations are anchored in the real world. They gather qualitative information essential to develop policy which complements and gives meaning to statistical data. I would like to share a quote from the late Professor Donna Woods who spoke at a roundtable organized by the Ad Council Foundation, and I spoke a lot of her work in second reading. <clears throat> she said at some point, all governments need a high quality knowledge infrastructure to support evidence-based policy design and implementation. This includes advisory bodies, permanent and ad hoc, that provide governments with information, facts and evidence-based analysis and advice along all phases of the policy cycle. Permanent advisory bodies tend to have broad and long-term expertise, while ad hoc bodies often serve as a fast-track option for governments seeking more specialized advice on short notice. Il faut aussi dire que l'assurance emploi... Furthermore, EI has implications for human resource management among companies. It influences human capital investment decisions for workers. Any change to the EI program has positive or negative impacts on businesses and workforce decisions. That's why it is so important to take into account the needs of companies and the workforce. After all, through their contributions, they're funding the entire program, which cost around $30 billion in 2021. But what are the needs of the workforce and businesses now? The economic context has changed since the program's founding in 1940 and since the last major reform in 1994. The aging population and associated labor shortages, the climate crisis, technological challenges linked to the use of artificial intelligence, to name but a few require major investments in skills development, which is largely under provincial jurisdiction. In addition to supporting workers' incomes during involuntary job interruptions, which is at the origin of unemployment insurance, Canadians also need to improve their skills. The issue of skills development is often underestimated in public debates and election campaigns. In my experience, politicians often think that Canadians don't want training. Consequently, they leave this issue out of their election campaigns on the grounds that it's not to their advantage during a campaign. But how do Canadians perceive their training needs? In the final analysis, Canadians are the ones who have to face the challenges before them. They're the ones who need the training. But how do they perceive their needs for training? To try and answer this question, in December 2019, I undertook a survey with the firm Nanos on the issue. In 2023, I asked the same firm, Nanos, to update the results of the survey and find out whether the pandemic and subsequent economic interruptions had changed Canada's perceptions of their training needs as well as threats posed by technological and climate change to their jobs and occupations. The results of both surveys pointed in the same direction and may come as a surprise to this country's politicians. Here's a few of the main results. The first question dealt with the impact of technological and climate change on employment. We asked the following question. According to experts, technological change, such as automation, the arrival of artificial intelligence, online commerce, and the sharing economy could have significant effects on the job market. 
To what extent? Do these changes threaten your job? 20% of working people think their job is threatened by these changes. That's the equivalent of 4 million Canadians. More young people between 18 and 34 think their jobs are threatened. And British Columbians are the most worried about their jobs. Then, we asked how these changes might affect their tasks at work and possibly require training. 37% of employed respondents think their job tasks will be affected and they'll need training. That represents 8 million Canadians. Again, young people responded most strongly with a yes, 42%. These results are consistent with the 2019 survey. Then, we asked all Canadians about their perception of their skills deficit and their more specific needs in terms of training. We asked them which of the following statements best corresponded to their situation. One, I'm already well trained. Two, I'm interested in training. Three, I'm interested in training, but I don't have the time. Four, I'm interested in training, but I don't have the money. Five, I'm not interested in training. And six, I don't know. The answer could surprise skeptics. Just under half of Canadians, 49%, want training. That represents 16 million Canadians. Among those in full-time employment, that's more than three in five who want training. Young people between 18 to 34 are most interested in training, 66%. Then Canadians aged 55 and over, who represent three-quarters of those not interested in training. Interest is high in the prairies, where 51% say they're interested in training. We also asked Canadians about their preferred training content. We asked them whether they agreed or disagreed with each of the following statements. I should take training to improve, one, my reading skills. Two, my mathematics skills. Three, my computer skills, such as using internet tools. Or four, my work skills, my professional skills. The training courses that arose that arouse the most interest are computer related, where forty percent of Canadians, and professional skills with forty percent of Canadians. That's around fifteen million Canadians who want to improve their computer skills and 13 million who want to improve their professional skills. These data indicate that the need for skills development is immense and that Canadians are aware of the challenges and want to learn. Canada must capitalize on the willingness of, on the part of Canadians to train and on the willingness of labour market players to commit to skills development. The programme d'assurance chômage the employment insurance program is already being used to upgrade workforce skills. It supports incomes and finances training expenses to adapt the workforce. But employers and workers who are the funders of EI and the only contributors to the plan want the plan to do more and better in the face of the major challenges ahead. In the context of EI Part 2, where over $6 billion is invested annually through labour agreements, EI is in fact the cornerstone of training funding in the workforce in Canada. For Canada's economic future, it is therefore increasingly clear that skills development is a strategic lever. That is what is at stake in this pro project, which has the support of the main associations linked to the labour market, whether from the business world or, work or the worker side. Let's now take a closer look at Bill S-244. Section 1 of the bill creates an EI Council in the Act respecting the uh, Department of Employment and Social Development. Section 2 amends the same Act. To specify in a single section the current powers and duties of the EI Commission, which are described here and there in the various sections of the Act. The wording of this section is taken from the Ministry's website. 
Briefly, here are the clarifications made in Section 2. Observe and evaluate the assistance provided under the Employment Insurance Act and submit an annual report on its evaluation to the Minister, who then tables it in Parliament. Review and approve policies on the administration of employment benefits and support measures under the Employment Insurance Act and make regulations under this Act and the Employment Insurance Act. It is hiring, uh, engaging the services of an actuary and to prepare actuarial forecasts and estimates. Also setting the employment insurance premium rate for each year and working with the government of each province to develop and implement employment insurance benefits and measures. The Commission could benefit from the support of an advisory board to carry out its functions, including observation, evaluation, review, and approval of policies and regulations, and liaison with the provinces. That's very important. Before constitute the body of this bill, it amends the Department of Employment and Social Development Act by creating a Part 3.1 to the Act concerning the Employment Insurance Council. This section reads as follows. The Employment Insurance Council is hereby established to provide advice and recommendation to the Commission on its own initiative or at the request of the Commission on any matter affecting the powers, duties, and function of the Commission, subject to such limitation as the Commission may provide. Indeed, Article 3 provides that the Commission may limit the matters on which the Council may give advice. In this way, the Advisory Council has a power of initiative within the remit of the Commission. In other words, the bill strike a balance between ministerial power and power of the labor market partners sitting on the Council. As for the composition of the Council, the bill sets a minimum of 12 members while ensuring equal representation between labor and management organization. It is co-chaired by commissioner representing the business community and labor organization. The co-chairs may invite the representative of the provinces and territory, territories designated by the Forum of Labour Minister, as well as Aboriginal representative to Indigenous people to better fulfil their mandate. This project of law cannot improve the efficacy. This bill can only improve the effectiveness of the EI program. It will make it possible to obtain reliable information and take into account the realities experienced by companies and workers, thereby facilitating the implementation of new skills development strategies. Social dialogue is practiced in Canada at provincial, sectoral, health and safety and apprenticeship levels, but is clearly inadequate when it comes to EI. As an example, in Quebec, the Commission, uh, Commission des Partenaires du Marché du Travail, the Commission of Labour Market Partners, which I spoke about at length on second reading, is involved in the management of these public funds, particularly those devoted to training, which are mainly financed by EI. The Canadian Mining and Tourism sector Sectoral Committees, largely financed by EI, are also successful examples of Canada-wide social dialogue. By adopting S244, Canada would be honouring its past commitments. In particular, Convention C-88 on Employment Services, as well as its commitment to support the implementation of Sustainable Development Goals and the Global Deal. But, above all, Canada would acquire, would acquire an additional tool, social dialogue, that can help it cope with major economic trends, such as the aging of the population, labour shortages, the climate crisis, and technological challenges associated with the use of artificial intelligence. These major trends will require rapid adaptation of the workforce and the constant acquisition of new skills. I'm not the only one convinced of the need to set up a permanent social dialogue table around these issues. In order to develop a shared vision between companies and unions, and Skills Roundtable, initiated by my office in 2019 with the participation of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Labour Congress and Collège Canada, came into being precisely because many economic players wanted to be able to develop a common vision of skills development and lifelong learning 
while respecting federal and provincial jurisdiction. It was thanks to this roundtable that Bill S244 came into being. Cette table ronde a tenu plusieurs rencontres, la première en janvier 2020. This roundtable has held several meetings, the first in January 2020, others in virtual mode during the COVID, organized by commissioners representing employers and workers, and a final one on February 12th, which I organized with the commissioners and the participation of Senators Cardozo and Youssef. The roundtable was held in the Senate. The following organization took part in the discussion, which aimed to provide an update on Bill 244. For the business community, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the Conseil du Patronat du Québec, the Business Council of Canada, the Canadian Home Builder Association, and the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. For the Labour Association, the Canadian Labour Congress, UNIFAR, Canadian Building Trade Union, and the Confederation des Syndicats Nationaux. Also, Tourism et Human Resource Canada and the Mining Industry Human Resource Council have also participated to this event. Les sénateurs, uh, Youssef, uh Senators Hassan Youssef, Andrew Cardozo, and Krista Ross also participated in the roundtable. Participants representing the labour market, so businesses and workers, reaffirmed the need to create a permanent table within the framework of the Employment Insurance Commission and expressed the wish that the Senate pass this bill quickly so that it can be sent to the other chamber. I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this bill. In addition to those mentioned earlier, I would particularly like, like to thank the Honourable Perrin Beatty, Diana Palmerin Balesco, and Leonard of the Chamber of Commerce of Canada, Bea Brusque of the CLC, as well as former CLC Chairman Senator Hassan Youssef and Chris Robert. I would also like to thank Jess Meganet of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and Irene Harrison of UNIFOR. My team worked on this project from near and far. Hermione Tomaras, Julie Labelle Morissette, Anne Allard, Jeremy Soucy, Alexandre Matar Michaud, also long teammate Michel Cournoyer, economist and former founder director of the Commission des Partenaires du Marché du Travail au Québec. Last but not least, a special thank to the two commissioners, Pierre La Liberté for the Labour Organization and Nancy Ely for the Employer Organization who they wish to pursue the social dialogue undertaken. In conclusion, I hope you have convinced that the practice of dialogue social is... In closing, I hope to have convinced you that the practice of social dialogue is a powerful tool for better understanding labor market needs and implementing the best solutions in a context where stakeholder buy-in is essential to achieving shared prosperity and to have convinced you that the creation of an advisory board to the Employment Insurance Commission is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Senator Dong. Question. Uh, thank you, uh, not only for your work on this, but bringing your expertise in your career to this discussion. But I'm concerned, uh, listening carefully to your speech, that the regional sensitivities on EI are not reflected in the council or the advisory committee. We, of course, have labor uh, workers, we have businesses in Prince Edward Island, but what we don't have is national labor organizations and we don't have national uh, business groups. I'm wondering how you will re reflect in this council and advisory committee the regional importance of EI to our seasonal economy. Thank you for the question, Senator Dunn. Uh, I, will, I will have to say that this round table of 12 in the bill has the power to invite representatives of the provinces, so from any provinces, to hear from them. And uh, they have the power also to invite indigenous groups so that they know better about their needs in the labor market. So in this way, um, it, is, um, it is focused on the needs in the region. If the organization in your province are not organized provincially and nationally within the CLC or other groups for the workers or the Chamber of Commerce, it will provide uh, 
time and place to meet with different provinces. So the beauty of this bill, I think, is because EI is an exclusive federal jurisdiction, it was provincial before, but now it's federally, it's federal, and because the needs and the delivery system is within the province, we need to make connections between where the, the, the federal government who have the money, who have the fund, and the provinces who spend the money. So in this way, otherwise there's nothing. It's the commission the, the, and the, the government, they make consultation, they hear one thing or another, and as you know, EI reform has not been done, uh, has not been pro progressing at all. So this advisory board at least is mainly focused at the beginning on part two on training, but with time, it could give advice on other issue uh, that the commission has on the strategy of EI. So it is an opportunity uh, to be able to for the government to be able to propose a strategy in the in manpower development. So that's my answer. Senator Don. Senator, so thank you for that answer. Um, I think this bill would be much stronger if there was requirement for every province and region to have representation as opposed to they may appoint people from the regions. For example, in Prince Edward Island, it would be far more important to have agricultural voices and people from the fishing community, uh, given the seasonal nature of the EI work, my seatmate, Senator Black, would know more about the agricultural than I do, and Senator Robson, the former national president. But not many farmers are plowing the fields today in Prince Edward Island. They're depending on EI to carry them over. The same is true for the fishing industry. In 2021, the Erst and Young did a report that the fisheries value in exports to PEI is a billion dollars. Uh, that's a significant employer of people, important part of the economy, but very little fishing happens this time of year. Those voices would have to be heard on this advisory committee and council. They may be heard, they're likely not to be heard. I think there's er areas you, that could improve this bill to represent those regional concerns on EI. Do you agree? I don't agree, Senator Down. I don't agree because we've juggled around this bill uh, on those issues, and this bill is not mine. It's the bill that was uh, built with uh, the organization, uh, the employers and the, the, the unions organization. We worked a long time. We had many scenarios, and this was the proper scenario, the workable scenario to get something done. And uh, uh, so this is... Uh, the way the, the, the way that is that is proposed and the link with the provinces is is made through this council who can invite uh, sectorial industries regional uh, they could invite any observer they want to d discuss any specific issue but the board as such uh, is a permanent board it's the same person they build trust together and they are able to know how to spend the money efficiently for the needs of the enterprises and for manpower. So, uh, but your concern is legitimate and it will be taken into account through observe, uh, in, invite, invitation made by the council to the group who may write, write their concern and they, they'll be heard. Senator Town. To that, Senator Belmara, I, I would make the final question uh, and a concern. You know, as a regional chamber, it's part of our responsibility to take in those regional views and the concerns of, I suspect, of Maritimers hearing about changes to EI is that it has a national focus that is central Canada and the West, maybe not the North, maybe not the Maritimes, maybe not Atlantic Canada. The way to solidify this uh, concern and address it is to make these not optional, but as a requirement that these voices from the regions be heard in this bill, and I think you would find much more support for it, uh, given the importance of EI in the region, 
as again, I said earlier, because of her seasonal nature of the economy, her economy is doing well, uh, but you can't work 12 months, unfortunately, in some of these industries. So w will, will this group you consult? Well, I'll ask this question. Who did you consult in the Maritimes about this bill? Um, the EI program is financed through uh, workers and business from different parts of the country. We didn't do a specific regional consultation for that. We consult the business community and the worker community at the organizational level. And uh, otherwise, it, will not, it would be very, very difficult to organize, uh, to have a big board. And, uh, of, and we thought that this way to organize it, it's, it's linked with the minister, the labor market minister forum. Okay. So we can have the, uh, the input of uh, regional or sectorial also, in, in other way by uh, the organization, for the needs uh, of those uh, agents. So. Uh, 